There you go. <laughs> Good afternoon. We'll call the uh, October 27th the informational agenda or informational meeting to order. I'm uh, Vice Chair Costello. Uh, Chair Litz is unavailable today. Uh, we will start off the meeting with the City Council staff reports. Good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. And a couple of reminders. Uh, there is no 7 o'clock meeting tonight, uh, but there is a land use committee meeting. Uh, in addition, tomorrow there's a Charter Revision Commission meeting at 3 o'clock here at the Carnegie Town Hall, and then at 4 o'clock the Districting Commission meeting will occur. Um, before you, I put uh, last year's legislative agenda from the Council, and uh, just for, your, for open discussion purposes today. And, pardon me, I know I sent that to you earlier, so you had some time to take a look at that. Uh, I also wanted just to let you know, of course, we do tours, uh, particularly kids' tours, um, throughout the year, and Denise Tucker is, does a great job for all of you in uh, showing off the facility and also um, letting the kids be mayor or city council and, and uh, have a good time passing ordinances on what kind of ice cream is the best and all of that kind of fun stuff. It's a great time. And tomorrow we have the Harrisburg kids coming in. It's their third grade class, about 50 kids at 11 o'clock, so you're sure welcome to join us then if you wanted to. And then and just to kind of give you an update, um, part of what we've been doing, I, I know I've shared this with you in some memos over the summer, is to look at, um, through a number of sources, what does it mean to be uh, a strong mayor form of government? We are a home rule charter city, and so we're kind of breaking out some of those pieces of information and bringing that forward. One of the things we have done is gone back to our own Argus leader and those discussions in 1994 pulling some of those documents and kind of looking at what was that discussion in the public at the time as to what a strong mayor form of government meant. And then in addition, looking at some uh, organizational textbooks for cities and, and how that is defined really in more of an educational type uh, format and, and what that means. And then again, looking at cities in our region who are uh, preferably a uh, home rule charter, but certainly the strong mayor form of government. And so uh, we'll be talking to the Charter Revision Commission tomorrow a little bit about salary, salary ranges is one of their questions uh, they wanted us to take a look at on their behalf. So we have some salary ranges for the mayors and for city council members who are strong mayor forms of government and their term limits. Uh, what we have found is that for the most part there are no uh, limits for the terms for city council members. That would include cities like Omaha and St. Paul, Toledo, Lincoln, Nebraska, um, Rockford, Illinois, and some of those I uh, just wanted to let you know that that'll be part of our discussion tomorrow. Any questions? No questions then? Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Mayor Munson's office. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on behalf of Mayor Munson's office? Nope. We'll move on to Audit Committee. And on behalf of the Audit Committee, I will just note that uh, Rich uh, Oxel, our uh, lead internal auditor, is going to be presenting a couple of audit reports to us later on in open discussion. So we'll move on with fiscal committee. Councilor Jameson. Uh, we have no meeting today, but we do have one next uh, Monday in reference to a couple of updates. So, Okay, Councilor Jameson with land use. We'll be meeting right after this meeting, and you're all invited. We're going to do some trash talking <laughs> and some... Uh, you better qualify that. ...on garbage. We're going to talk about recycling and the garbage uh, hauling ordinance, as well as... Uh, railroad crossings on the east side, just what those impacts might be. So please join us. Uh, the chair of the uh, Public Service Committee is not here. Is anybody else from the Public Service Committee like to mention anything? No, nope, we'll pass on that then. Uh, City Council open discussion. Councilor Knutson. I just have a few quick items. Is one, I, regarding the Orpheum Theater and regarding the Sioux Empire Community Theater, I just wanted to remind everyone that The Crucible by Arthur Miller is the next play and it starts um, the uh, three weekends in a row, November 7th through the 9th, the 14th through the 16th, and the 21 through the 23rd. And um, that phone number for Sioux Empire Community Theater is 360-4800. And uh, an extra reason that I'm that I'm promoting this play, though I always try to pro promote the arts in our city, is because our very talented Denise Tucker is in this production. And so I wanted you to all know that. And then um, also I think that uh, you, you, if you haven't jotted this on your calendar, would you please note that um, the next Housing First meeting um, over in the Health and Human Services building in that conference room is Thursday, November 13th, at 10 a.m. And again, I love to just have different 
counselors rotate in and out of that discussion. And then I wanted to just share, it was great fun to, to um, um, find a whole page about the Summit League basketball tournament here in the newest issue of um, Sporting News College Basketball about Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and about the tournament moving to Sioux Falls, South Dakota on March 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. Uh, for this year, and then of course we hosted again, um, you know, in 2009, and then again 2010. And that fun article is on page 151, if you were wondering. And that's about all for right now. I, I, I would like to visit a little bit with the group about initiated measure 10, but I, I think that some of the rest of you have something to say about that. Thank you for your public service notices. Uh, next on the agenda, staff reports. Uh, or any other any other open discussion for the council, councilor? Uh, just briefly, um, a couple of my items to follow up. Homeless advisory board met today, and the numbers have been put together comparing how the pilot project um, funding compares to the earlier numbers we had in 2005. I hadn't had a chance to go through it completely, but I will tell you the numbers look very good and show a cost savings in dealing with the chronic homeless. And we will schedule a time for that to be presented to the full council in an upcoming informational meeting. Uh, is there any uh, numbers on um, the homelessness going down? No, no. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> that may have been good no. numbers. Maybe that was. Part of the deal. I wish that was the case, but given the economy, I don't think that will be the case. This is strictly a report on measuring. Remember, before we took the top 11 chronic homeless yeah. people in Sioux Falls, and we determined that it cost more than $30,000 a piece in services to them. Um, we have Project Safe Home going on right now that the county is running that it takes 20 individuals that are in that chronic homeless category and over the last nine months it has measured what has been spent on them in community resources and uh, all along we've said we didn't know if, if this program, Housing First, would reduce the cost per individual. That was our hope but we didn't know if we could reduce it but certainly increase efficiency in how the resources are used and get them into housing and, uh, and what we're seeing is the, the cost is lower uh, through this experiment and we can get you the specific numbers um, as soon as that report is completely wrapped up. Um, Council Brown, another item. Um, I had noted, seemed that I had a conversation with somebody regarding the school district um, dealing with a significant number, increased number of homeless children. Has that crossed your desk as far as the homeless coalition and is there anything being done regarding that or are we still focus primarily on the chronic? Homeless? No, um, you know chronic is one piece of it, families are another and just today we were briefed a little bit about that through a separate meeting as well. Um, there are some challenges in the way homelessness is defined in the county versus what the school district defines it um, but there is definitely an increased need um, in the community because of what's going on in the economy right now and there's some immediate needs county and uh, the school district we're talking today about how to address those immediate needs and long term figure out how best to get people into that service pipeline. Great. Councilor Knudsen. Um, Councilor Costello, on that question uh, as, far, um, as far as the large number of families in our community that are homeless, young children, it's very, very sad and I of course am very concerned about the chronically homeless but I'm even more concerned about these homeless families. But I, w I wonder if sometime now that the temperatures are getting lower and lower too, I wonder if sometime at an informational we might want to have Wendy, um, is her last name Gabing, um, for the homeless coordinator for the school system who, who works with these families every single day of the week, come in again and just do kind of a homeless update with us for 15, 20 minutes, would that be appropriate? Actually, I, we're planning that in conjunction with the report oh, okay. too, so she will be uh, oh, a part okay. of that discussion. Oh, thank you. Any other discussion on that type? Councilor Knudsen? Regarding the chronically homeless site committee meeting that we had a week ago, again, we just are really having very, very good conversations and we have, thanks to some um, very, very capable staff people. We have wonderful maps of downtown and we're still, you know, just trying to decide if, if we should, you know, go for, um, you know, building a facility on land like that the city owns, like up by where the Penn View Trailer Court used to be or, um, I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages, you know, however you do anything, including locations of chronically homeless places. I call them home at last. 
now. That's my new name for this. But, you know, there are advantages also to having such a home downtown near, you know, near our services for those important people too. So anyway, we welcome input from the whole community. We are, we would still love to find a philanthropist out there that cares so much about the homeless that he or she might want to even give us some land or donate a building for us to use because this is a community program, not a city council, just county one. Any other thoughts? Councilor Brown? Just one more thing. Um, in this preliminary report, we had letters from Detox, Carroll Institute, all uh, recognizing that they, and even uh, anecdotal reports from the library, that they are seeing uh, less issues with homelessness um, of the chronic homeless being in their facilities. I'm talking about Carroll Institute or Detox, and the library seeing um, less of chronic homeless people hanging out in the library as a result of the Project Safe Home, um, which is surprising to see at this point when we're only nine months into the, to the experiment. Any other comments? No? Okay, we'll move into the staff reports if there's no other topics for discussion. First one is our monthly financial update by uh, Director of Finance, Eugene Roanhorse. Nothing but good news today, please. Uh, last I saw the stock market, it was actually up, unlike uh, uh, the Nikkei in Hong Kong and, North and South Korea were down substantially uh, when they opened this morning, but we were still up 132 last I saw that, which was about an hour and a half ago. Hey, up is up. That's good. Maybe we found the bottom. You don't, don't agree? <laughs> <coughs> If you know where it's at, let me know so I can invest at the right time. Gene Roanhorse, Director of Finance for the City of Sioux Falls. Uh, you should have received your uh, financial reports for the month of September uh, last Thursday, I think. I uh, got hard copies and, and then you received electronic copies. Um, I guess the, uh, uh, the best way I can explain things right now at uh, September 30th is dull, which is the way I like it. Uh, there's not, uh, not much going on. We seem to be, uh, be pretty much uh, staying on track. Uh, if you go to uh, page one, uh, just uh, draw your attention again up at the top and in, in the box up there, the 33% uh, 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 ratio that we have for, uh, for our reserves. Um, we're anticipating, and, and it is, we're starting to look at year end now um, uh, of uh, 08 and uh, try and anticipate what what's the year-end numbers are going to look like. And uh, so far, that, uh, the, the ratios look like they're going to come in fine for the, uh, for the reserves. Um, if you go just across the, to the right-hand side of that box, uh, you'll see we have 24.8%, uh, which is uh, our reserve that we want to have for cash. Um, that number is down just a little bit and it will go down in October and possibly uh, even in November, depending on when we actually get our taxes. Uh, one of the things down the right-hand column there, you, you can uh, note that um, where the actual revenue is versus budget, the revenue is 65% uh, and uh, we're more like uh, 70 plus percent uh, spent out for the year. That's again because of our real estate taxes and our uh, frontage tax uh, don't come in uh, you, yeah you have to pay them on November 1st so we get them around the end of November first of uh, first of December time frames when we get them so I'm not sure whether you'll see them in December um, yeah, but they will be there and uh, of course in in the December report um, on page two the um, uh, thing to note there, it hasn't changed. We've got uh, 256,000 in, uh, in balances left. Um, so that, for all practical purposes, is used up. I should go back and point out, uh, looking at the operating funds, we're uh, working very closely right now with the uh, various directors uh, to uh, forecast their numbers. Uh, they look like they're coming in. Uh, we're probably going to come back uh, next month for a supplemental for the transit uh, department. It's, it's not uh, a supplemental that's coming out of um, 
uh, the general fund or anything like that. It's it's existing funds that are there. Uh, they're they're coming. Well, we can look at them later on back here, but uh, they need uh, uh, to appropriate funds that they have essentially sitting in their bank account. Uh, so they'll be coming in for a, a, a supplemental. We're also probably going to have a supplemental from uh, parks, but that is money that's been gifted to the city and we need to have an appropriation of those funds also. So there's a couple of things we know about. We're not aware of any other supplementals at this point. Uh, hopefully nothing jumps out of the woodwork and uh, bites us, but uh, that, that's as much as we know about it right now. Uh, sales tax, uh, unfortunately I don't have the October sales tax number for you. We don't have the last check. We got, we got uh, one check uh, about the middle of the month. Uh, that really doesn't tell you much until you see the month end one. The one thing that did happen is we uh, we got a check for a $200,000 uh, tax audit. So uh, somebody wrote out a nice size check for sales tax that they weren't uh, dealing with appropriately. Um, you can look at the other funds. Um, and uh, let's see. Transit is down at the bottom of page four, so you can look at that. Uh, you can see that uh, they've got uh, a million two sitting in their account, and like I say, they've just run out of appropriation, so we'll need to appropriate some of that. That's where the supplemental appropriation will come from. Um, the um, going to page seven are the uh, enterprise funds. They're all uh, looking uh, quite well. Uh, water is a little bit. Uh, tight. They, you know, they've uh, got some projects that are SRF loans, and those are trailing uh, repayments. Uh, so, uh, in the, from they're they're generating their nice cash flows. Uh, you can see they're uh, six million, six million five uh, year to date, uh, and that's right on track with uh, with their plan. But then their capital expenditures take them twenty thousand, uh, twenty million the other way. But like I say, that's primarily SRF money coming in. Um, other than that, uh, in the uh, in the capital improvement section, um, the one one big one, uh, uh, two of them that, that are still uh, not started, uh, about uh, three fifths of the way down page nine, there's two million one fifty there that hasn't been started. That is state funds involved with, uh, uh, I believe it is um, North Kiwanis, somewhere up north. And uh, so that, that's why that's not been, uh, that's really a state project. And then on page 10, uh, almost to the bottom, you see a million 139 uh, there, which uh, is, is underway, but um, that's the, uh, the zoo uh, money that has come in from uh, contributions. Uh, so, and I really don't have anything else to, uh, uh, say that it's out of uh, sync with where we, where we think we'd be at this point in time. Uh, all we're waiting for now is to see how our sales tax comes in. Gene, regarding the sales tax, um, we're, we kind of held steady here at that 1.1 percent uh, growth. And in previous uh, months, you had indicated that uh, we're, we're probably going to be okay with 2008 because we've got some unanticipated revenue, uh, bank franchise fees and interest was up and things like that. Does that continue to hold? Yes, that, that's what I was telling you. We, uh, we've been working with the department heads to get forecasts uh, uh, going out through the end of the year. Uh, 08 is looking fine. Uh, as we don't anticipate any issues there. We've had, like you say, some additional revenues come in. Um, uh, but the, uh, the, it's, there's still the money's going to come out. We'll, we'll, have, we'll run a slight a slight surplus for the year right now is what we're looking at. Councilor Brown? Gene, question on um, while the sales tax is at 1.1% growth, what's going on with the entertainment tax that looks up like it's up significantly and lodging tax is also doing well? People still like to go out to restaurants and eat, I guess. Okay. I mean, it, it's, uh, right. it's a uh, uh, kind of a strange anomaly, uh, but that's about the only thing that we can come up with is uh, is uh, the, the restaurants are, are still doing well. Uh, we seem to keep opening up new ones all the time, so um, that's, that we really don't have any way of knowing exactly what's going on there. Uh, but that's the only thing that we can come out with. 
the, uh, the interesting thing uh, about the sales tax uh, that still is uh, somewhat mystifying, the state is, is running around 6% growth rate. So they're still, they're still coming in okay, and we're running at 1.1. Now I think we sh we've shown some of you from the, in the fiscal committee the charts where we charted the, the sales tax uh, for the, like Watertown, Brookings, um, Rapid City, I'm not sure who else. For up until uh, about March, the tax rate in Sioux Falls in Rapid City was up on top of the chart, running it at 6%, and the others were a little bit lower. Come June, that thing flip-flopped, and Rapid City and Sioux Falls are on the bottom as far as sales growth, sales tax growth. Now, again, we can't really figure out what's doing that. One thing that we're speculating is that people aren't traveling to do their shopping. Um, Sioux Falls has a huge draw going west of Sioux Falls in particular. And, uh, you know, it, it, when gas was four bucks a gallon, and then it, we'll see if that changes. That might prove our, our thesis that what we're thinking. But when gas was at four bucks a gallon, it did in fact tighten things down as far as people actually traveling. Uh, but I thought it was kind of unique that uh, the state is, is staying up there. and. Uh, the two largest markets are, are down. Council Knudsen. Regarding um, transit, um, in today's USA today, there's a very interesting article about AIG being really involved in lots of transit companies in the country. And I was actually going to bring the article, but my husband hadn't read the paper yet, so I thought I'd better not cut out the article. But but I was, I'm just hoping that AIG is not involved in our in the company that runs our fit, transit system. Um, that's Sutran. I don't know what who the parents are of Sutran. I've never really looked at the corporate structure of that thing. I don't know who the actual parent company is. Councilor Staggers. Yes, uh, Gene, you mentioned the supplemental for the transit. Uh, do you know how much that's going to be about? Probably somewhere around two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Is that primarily to cover the costs of the arbitrator's decision, or? That's all in there. Okay. That, okay. that money is, has been dispersed. Also, I have a question, too, about the farmer's market. Um, is that under Falls Park Development um, 010064? What page are you on? Page 10. Or is that something else? Just. Under parks. Falls Park Development. Okay, where about? That's, that's where it would be, mm -hmm. in parks. What's the number that you said? Uh, the number is 010064. Uh, I can't answer with what that is for specifically if that's a if that's, that's the market or if that's some of the fall, falls improvements uh -huh. that they're talking about. The reason I was asking is I heard that, um, you know, we had anticipated spending, three hundred, I think, $380,000 for the farmer's market. And I heard that we got a bid for $1.1 million. Is that correct? I haven't seen those. Okay. We'll, we'll get that information for you, though, okay. what the status of it is. Councilor Staggers, if I might, I think that included the parking lot. I'm not sure that that was the parking lot portion of that was originally in the 300000 that you're referring to. Well, we had the um, also the problem with it being with located the, on a garbage Yeah, the pilings, dump, And yeah. we had the, the, right. the uh, foundation. We had to spend a lot of extra for that. And, right. Uh, but uh, I think it, I think the total is about that, right? About that one point three, including a parking right? lot. Well, I'll, I'll get you an answer for that. Oh, okay. That, that's that's easy to do. I just don't okay. recognize Falls Development exactly what that means. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No other questions for Director of Finance. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay, the next item we had a uh, presentation uh, scheduled by the Executive Director of the South Dakota Municipal League, Yvonne Taylor, and she is uh, not able to be with us today, and so I thought we'd just open it up for uh, council discussion. I know Councilor Brown is uh, involved with the Municipal League. Would you like to share some information with us? I will. Uh, in Yvonne's absence, I'll pinch hit a little bit here. I did talk to her briefly on the phone. She's ill today, so she couldn't be here. Um, for those of you who don't know, South Dakota Municipal League is an organization that's been around for 75 years. Sioux Falls was involved since its inception. It's an organization that uh, use, works as a unified voice for all city governments uh, in peer on issues. A couple of recent issues that it has helped us with, for example, last year in dealing with more local control in alcohol issues. Um, a little farther in the past, uh, the state, Gene was talking about sales tax dollars. When the state streamlined that, we are charged a fee uh, for the state collecting the sales tax and distributing it out to the cities. And Municipal League renegotiated that agreement when it was streamlined because it was a simpler process, saving Sioux Falls a half million dollars a year going forward. So it's an organization that, that speaks on behalf of all cities. Um, Yvonne had provided me with uh, some of the issues that she believes why, in addition to not, um, this could seriously harm the South Dakota Municipal League, um, initiative number 10. And she had some other issues that she wanted to talk to us about. Um, her concerns, number one, uh, the Yes on 10 organization won't reveal where they've gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars in funding this campaign. And number two, it limits the input from public servants with practical knowledge about how laws affect our city, county, and school district because it doesn't allow a coordinated effort, what, much like what the South Dakota Municipal League does for us in peer. So it means that each of us as individuals would have to go out and do the lobbying instead of uh, having the Municipal League do it on behalf of the city. Also, her concern is with uh, it being confusing and poorly written, and one example is the de definition of immediate family. It reads, any spouse, child spouse, child, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, parent, sibling, grandparent, grandchild, stepbrother, stepsister, stepparent, parent-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, guardian, or domestic and domestic partner. So that means that if any of those people defined as your immediate family are doing any business with government in the state, you would be disallowed from uh, doing any discussion with those elected officials. Number four, because it gags the local nonprofit service that provides care for the elderly, help of victims of uh, violence, and provide transportation for the disabled by not allowing them to speak to us. Um, I'm sure Councillor Beninga in his daytime job could relate to that as well. And number five, because it denies business people, even in small communities, if they sell something small in the, in the hardware store to the school, the, uh, that business person would not be allowed to talk about issues with school board members. And then finally, um, as someone who worked under the guise of the First Amendment, it really does limit the, the free speech of thousands of South Dakotans. And, and is not open government because it doesn't allow people to honestly share their opinions if they do any shape or form of uh, business with a government. So those were the, some of the concerns she had there. And um, South Dakota Municipal League is an organization that does great work for all of our cities, and it could greatly um, hurt its ability to do that for cities across the state. Thanks for that update. Uh, Councilor Knudsen. Yeah, I guess I would just like to add to uh, what Councilor Brown said about initiated measure uh, 10. I personally, I usually don't feel like elected officials should get very involved in ballot issues. I think they usually, um, you know, speak for themselves and so forth. But for really um, not weeks but months, I've been kind of accumulating a pile of articles at home about initiated measure 10 and, and continue to believe that it is a very, very bad um, uh, very, very poorly written and very bad idea for South Dakota, besides being very secretive as far as the funding source. Um, but I, I mean, again, um, Councilor Brown serves all of us on the board of directors for the Municipal League. And for, for months now, we have received um, uh, our monthly magazine from Municipal League just telling us really what a terrible idea Initiative Measure 10 is. And I mean, I would just like to echo Councilor Brown's comments, and I realize that I've waited a little bit too long to probably do very much at the council level on this, but, you know, in the um, October 2008 South Dakota Municipal 
Municipalities magazine. Um, there are two uh, comments that I, you know, that really stood out to, to me again today when I was uh, rereading this information. Initiated Measure 10 is a cynical, deceptive attempt to manipulate South Dakota's voters by restricting political participation in the name of open government. I mean, because everyone in the world is for open government, really. I mean, it sounds good and it actually is very important also, but I think this is a very deceptively written uh, initiative. And like Council Brown said, I mean, besides the fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars uh, to fund the other side uh, are, uh, we have not a clue where that money came from. And then again, at the bottom of the con message on the ballot, it says it lists, and I'm talking about against initiative measure 10, it lists 20 categories of your relatives plus domestic partner. If any of them receive $500 or more from state slash local governments and you contribute anything to any political campaign, then you are guilty of a crime unless you can prove in court that you didn't know about the $500. And I could go on and on and on. I guess there, um, you know, in, in the another um, issue of municipal, well, I guess this was the Oct October one for uh, South Dakota municipalities also. Um, Yvonne, um, our very capable executive director for the Municipal League, says in her monthly column, literally hundreds of thousands of South Dakotans would not be able to support the candidates of their choice. Why? Because one of their distant relatives might do some amount of business with any level of government in the state. And um, anyway, I just think it's a very, very bad idea for South Dakota. And I know that the deadline for... Um, you know, resolutions was 10 o'clock this morning, but if in fact, you know, the resolution that the Municipal League um, had prepared uh, for us for model, model legislation, if there were five others of you that wanted to walk this in next Monday night just to stand up on this important issue, I would uh, lead the charge. Any other comments? Council Staggers? Uh, yes. Um, you know, oftentimes on the City Council, we just get one point of view. And this is what's going on right now. We're getting one point of view. Uh, we're having some claims being made that um, some people would say are just, you know, not exactly correct. And so what I've done is I've called somebody to see if they could come over here right now and present another point of view. Because, you know, as a deliberative body, you know, we don't want to hear just one point of view. Now, granted, there are a lot of uh, people in, in South Dakota, city officials, that uh, are against this. You know, I, I don't think it's a perfect initiative, but some of the comments I've heard about Initiative 10 are just way overboard. And then also some of the advertising that's done is just way overboard. So I think it's important uh, for the sake of democracy to allow another point of view to be presented. And I can see right now we do have somebody from uh, Initiative 10 here to speak. And, and so I would hope that uh, my colleagues on the council uh, would uh, listen to, to another point of view at this time. I would entertain uh, opinions from the rest of the council on whether or not we want to go further into this conversation. That you know, we've talked about, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? The anti-10 point of view, I think that just having, we've had two people speak against it, which is okay, but I think it would be appropriate if we had at least one person uh, to give another point of view. Okay. You know, this is an information. Well, let's hear what others have to okay. say. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Council Jameson. We I have, wouldn't be opposed for a few minutes of uh, further discussion on it, I guess, yeah. as long as it doesn't turn into a long, drawn out, but I, th I think it's fair. I don't think we spent 15 minutes on this topic, but maybe if we could, you know, five, yeah. seven minutes, would that be acceptable? I think just having another point of view would sure. be helpful, yes. Okay, and if you want to invite that person up, whoever that is. Yes. If you could please state your name and address. Thank you, City Council, for allowing, us, allowing me to speak. My name is Dina Esmanscheid. My address is 4400 Chippewa Circle. Apartment number 10, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57106. Um, I am the field director for the Yes on 10 campaign. I apologize if I seem a little winded. I literally got the call and said, go over to city council. My office is about two blocks, not even a block away. 
grabbed my coat and started running, wasn't sure what I was walking into. Um, I'm not sure if the discussion was that you all are thinking about passing a resolution against initiated measure 10 or what. If that is the case, I would like to address um, you all considering, concerning a um, Attorney General's opinion, uh, opinion number 88-28, that was done by Attorney General Roger Tellinghusen back in uh, 1998. In his opinion at that time, he said that for a city or a municipality to expend any resources opposing or supporting any type of ballot initiative was against the law and should not be done. And the purpose for that being that since those city resources are tax funds and the, the citizens of the city do not have a say once we pay our taxes as to how they're being used, any dissenter to those funds being used for an election would therefore be having their freedom of speech infringed upon because they can't stand up and say, no, wait, don't use my tax dollars to pay those. Now, recently, Attorney General Long has said that, well, that doesn't apply just to resolutions being passed. We do have a civil case in Brown County right now where a Brown County citizen is suing the Brown County County Commission for passing just such a resolution. The basis of that lawsuit is that in Brown County, the lights stayed on longer while that was being discussed. Uh, staff members were being paid to sit in the meetings while that resolution was being discussed. Um, the resolution itself was printed with taxpayer money. Um, it was um, on the agenda. Uh, it required an extra page on the agenda. So yes, some of the things like you all do need to post an agenda, but the fact that you might have extra paper going into that agenda, that is tax funds and tax resources which are not to be spent on legislative matters. And so I would really encourage you to not pass any sort of resolution against or for initiated measure 10 because it is not the place of a government to take a side on, um, on elections because that interferes with free election process. If you individually want to go to the press and make statements, that is fine, that is your duty as elected members of, of the city council. Now as to why I would encourage you to um, not only remain neutral but eventually vote yes on initiated measure 10, it's because it does stop taxpayer funded lobbying. And taxpayer funded lobbying is a principle of philosophy that even our founding fathers thought were just wrong. Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of our greatest founding fathers, said that to compel a person to pay contributions of money for the opinions of which he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. And yet that's what happens every year when people, groups, governments pay for lobbyists to go to peer to lobby for opinions which might not be supported by the people. Once again, if, the, if there is even one dissenting voice among the people that pay those taxes, they don't have a say once those taxes go out of their hands and are given to the lobbyist. Case in point, um, in 2004, I believe it was, there was a repeal of the food tax that was on the ballot, and I apologize if I got my year wrong there. I know that the Municipal League very strongly supported or um, opposed the repeal of the food tax and they did so both with contributions of time and money. While the Municipal League is one-third supported by dues paid by taxpayers through cities like your own. Those dues were then spent on a campaign of which many, many people in South Dakota voted against it. Now it's true that it, it did not pass, that the repeal did not pass. We still have the tax on food and currently we see that that tax is a very much a heavy burden on our elderly and on our young families and our poor families. But in fact, the taxes that were given to the Municipal League that then they spent on campaigning for the, against the repeal of food tax, those were taxes that were wrongly spent. Basically what we're saying is that if a group wants to lobby, they should be privately funded. They should not be tax funded. Now I understand that I'm speaking in front of the council right now and you all might be thinking in your heads, I've got another job, I've got other responsibilities, I've got to do this and that, I don't have time to go to peer. That may be, 
And if that is, maybe you should rethink your positions because as one of your jobs, you are uniquely situated as part of the city council to know what is best for the city of Sioux Falls. We elect you as citizens to speak and tell our legislators what is best for the city of Sioux Falls. We did not elect you to then hire lobbyists to go to Sioux Falls and speak on your behalf, especially when those lobbyists do not speak on my behalf or on Ms. Rath's behalf or on their behalf or on their behalf. Because the fact is that tax funds should never be used for lobbying because somebody might dissent. And trust me, if I said to you all, I'm not paying that tax, I think you guys would find me and make me pay. Now the other portion of this is, has to do with um, contracting and make sure that the government contracts are placed online. There are over 1,700 no-bid contracts just at the state level right now of, of South Dakota. In order to come up with that number, we had to sit down with several different people I wasn't one doing it, but some of our researchers sat down with several different people in state government and had to start digging through and asking. In order to get copies of those contracts, they had to pay a dollar a page. We still don't have copies of all of them because who in the world has $1,700 to pay for no big contracts, much less when they're multiple pages long. This is just not an effective system. It is not a very open system. Are the contracts currently available? Yes, but they can take a month or more to receive. And again, at a dollar a page, what average citizen is able to look those up? It also takes lots of time from the city officials or the county officials or the state officials whose jobs it is to make the copies, research, and all this other stuff versus if we had a simple system where a database could be entered into online, very simply, here's the basic information on contracts. At the uh, federal level, the United States instituted a website, much like the one we're asking for, for less than a million dollars and um, ahead of budget. So it was way under budget and ahead of timing. They did that this past year. It's usaspending.gov. It gives everyone a basic overview glance of what the federal government is spending, every single penny that's not classified for the government. And that includes things like um, which corporations got the contracts, who owns those corporations, what are they supposed to do, when are they supposed to do it, and how much are they getting paid to do it, and is this a bid contract or no bid contract. That's simply what we're asking for as far as the website goes. Um, I think in, I know as a matter of fact, that when government puts their spending online, it becomes clean. I'm not saying that it's not unclean right now, but in all cases there's always questionable things that might be present by opening it up so that the people can see. It adds a level of accountability so that um, people who might be thinking of doing wrong have to second guess themselves and have a second thought. We also have um, in this legislation, Initiated Measure 10, um, a piece that would directly affect you all. As holders of public offices that award contracts, when Initiated Measure 10 passes, you would not be able to accept campaign donations from the people to whom you've given a government contract or knowingly accept from their family members. This is a basic um, protection for the citizens of South Dakota and the citizens of Sioux Falls to make sure that pay to play contracting does not go on in our city and in our state. Pay to play contracting for those watching on TV that don't know is this idea of because um, you gave me a campaign donation I'm going to give you a contract. I'm not saying it goes on in this city right now, but the ability for it to go on exists. And so we just want to make sure that it does not happen. And again, looking at just not just the city, but the state and the county and the school boards from all across, it's quite possible. I've not had anybody so far tell me it does not go on. So anyway, we're urging the voters to vote yes on 10, and I am urging you all to not take a position on any resolution for or against 10. Thank you. Thank you. Is any there questions? any other comments? Councilor Knudsen? Yes, I just have a couple of comments. Uh, again, on the fairness of uh, time on this issue, again, like I said, I usually do not believe that elected officials should get too involved in ballot issues, but besides the uh, city council being a very important part of uh, a statewide organization that has existed for 75 years, 
which is Municipal League, and the fact that many, many, many other organizations in South Dakota have taken a very strong no stand on Initiated Measure 10, and I think the description gag law uh, is a very appropriate, is that, um, again, I, I uh, stand by what I said, is that I'm still willing to uh, sponsor a uh, walking in a, a resolution next Monday if uh, there are five of you that want to walk this in with me. And uh, if nothing else, I think it's just fine to have the uh, a discussion, and uh, I am not uh, one, you know, an Attorney General's opinion is merely that. It is merely an opinion by a person who is Attorney General, and the court system is there to uh, take care of uh, any uh, lawsuits that uh, result. But I am not one bit intimidated by the lawsuit that was filed against the Brown County not Commission, not one bit. Any other comments by any counselors? I see our city uh, assistant uh, city attorney is back there. Gail, do you have any comments for us? Well, I'll be brief. It's been a couple of years since I've read um, Roger Tellinghusen's attorney general opinion on this sort of issue, and I do believe there was um, support in that opinion for bodies of, of government like the city council educating and espousing their views on ballot question committees. Now, I'm not aware of what Larry Long has put forth on resolutions specifically on that. I'm certainly willing to go back to the office tomorrow and, and look into that. But as far as the attorney general saying a city council um, can espouse support for a ballot measure, I do not believe that's the case. Okay. Thank you. Unless there's any other comments, we'll move on. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, I, I read the Telling Hughes in a decision uh, a few weeks ago, and I've read uh, Initiative 10 uh, a number of times. And yeah, the Telling Hughes in decision, I, it's not clear. Um, he does say that, of course, that city councils and, and other elected bodies can, you know, educate um, the public about different issues. And of course, the real question is, you know, what is educating? How far does that go? But um, I guess uh, one of the things that, that's kind of bothered me um, during the past several months in regard to this issue uh, is, you know, what we have here on the front page of the uh, South Dakota Municipalities uh, magazine that's, that's sent to us. We've had about three or four covers here, about uh, ten. And, um, and going along with that notion is it's, it's called the gag law. I'll tell you, I, I've read this so many times. I, um, I uh, find it hard to believe that um, this can be called the gag law. Now, I, I've talked to, to one of the leaders in Initiative 10 and, you know, about my concern about these uh, commercials that have been airing now for months and months. And hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent on these commercials. And, you know, the, the answer I got was, you know, well, you know, this is a campaign. Sometimes, you know, things are stretched a little bit. And in this particular case, there is no doubt about the stretching that's going on to call this the gag law. And uh, I, I wish people uh, would just simply tr take a look at it uh, themselves, read it, and uh, if they like it, vote for it. If they don't like it, vote against it. Councilor Knudsen. In my, in my very last thought on this topic today is it's still amazing to me in the state of South Dakota with 750,000 people that when there are ballot measures, which again, I think everyone, when it gets right down to it, they obviously have the right to, to vote however they wish on every issue. That I'm very proud of our democratic system. But it is still amazing to me and unacceptable to me that groups from out of state funnel thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into some ballot issue initiatives and uh, choose to uh, remain secretive about the source of the revenue. That is amazing to me and continues to be unacceptable. Council Brown. Just from a personal level too, I'm married to a teacher who's very concerned about not being able to talk to the school board about the very career which she is involved with. Um, that's just one example as you've seen throughout this campaign. Um, the Attorney General spoke to Municipal League during that week. He said there's only one problem with this. It's unconstitutional plain and simple. And we'll spend thousands of dollars, taxpayer dollars, uh, once this goes into court should it pass. And finally, the last thing I would say, uh, any newspaper that has taken a stand on it 
has said that, uh, and listened to both sides, has said that uh, citizens, they're encouraging citizens to vote against it. Okay. Yeah. Councilor Staggers. Yeah. Um, you know, in regard to this being referred to as the gag law, I mean, we have Councilor Brown talking about his uh, wife not being able to talk to the school board. Like I said, I've read this over a number of times, and um, it's just not in there at all. It's not in there at all. And in regard to taking this to court, hey, that's true with any initiative. But there's one thing that's important to keep in mind here, and that is this is an initiated law. So for argument's sake, let's suppose it passes on November 4th. And uh, myself, I think there are things in the initiative that should be adjusted. But you know what can happen? The legislature in January can start taking a look at it and refine it to make it even better. It doesn't even have to go to court. Uh, because when I was in the state senate, we would often pass a law uh, one year. Then the next year, what happens? We're back trying to refine it some more. And that's the same way with this here, too. Uh, it can be refined by the state legislature if they want to do that. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll maybe move on to our reports by our lead internal auditor, Rich Soxel. We have two reports, an accounts payable and a property tax audit report. Rich Oaksel, lead internal auditor, and um, you should have got an electronic copy of the reports on Friday, and then you should have a hard copy in front of you. Um, I'd just like to have a, also a comment about transit uh, since it came up during the finance discussion. Um, we did our audit last spring of, of uh, the transit management, and we had some audit issues with uh, fixed assets. We went back in, I believe, September, and we looked at that issue again, and we saw a great improvement with the fixed assets, so um, we just wanted to let you know that, and, and the general manager wanted to make sure that you had that information too, so. Um, I think we'll look at the property tax audit first. And it's only about three pages, however, that, that represents quite a bit of work on the part of our audit staff. Uh, it was a new area for us. Uh, there was a lot to learn for us. And to make things more complicated, we, uh, the city limits are in two counties, obviously, Minnehaha County and Lincoln County. So that complicated things. We had to uh, make some trips down to Canton and look at some records down there. Uh, we want to express our, uh, our thanks for the cooperation and the courtesy shown to us by the, uh, the uh, equalization staff at both Lincoln and Minnehaha County. Uh, they were very patient with us and uh, took a lot of time with us to make sure we understood the process. Uh, we didn't have a lot of audit findings there. Um, we had a couple of recommendations to change the form for the uh, reduced uh, uh, reduced tax programs, and we, uh, we had some conversations with the planning department uh, to make a few changes there to make it uh, a little more clear to the people when they're filling out those forms. And they, uh, they uh, basically concurred with our recommendations to change the wording on, on, on the forms. And then if you look on page three there, um, in the middle of the report there, we, had, we identified about $95,000 um, that was due to the city that we had not received yet from Lincoln County. That did not have to do with property tax. Uh, it was just sort of a, uh, um, uh, an issue that came up when we were looking uh, at some audit reports from the state. We, we don't audit the, the county treasurer's office to see if the allocation was done properly for property tax, mainly because we don't have the authority to do that and the state auditors already do that. So we just looked at their reports and uh, we did notice that uh, in the report from 2007 of Lincoln County, there was a uh, identification of $95,000 that was misallocated to the city. And that had to do with, I believe, the, uh, the wheel tax. And it had to do with the problem with their, the database that they were using. It was, it was out of date. So the auditors identified that. We expect that money to come in this month. Um, we will follow up on that to see that, uh, that we get that $95,000. If you have any questions about this audit, I'll take those questions at this time. Councilman. I guess, Richard, uh, thanks for uh, the report, and I appreciate the, obviously, the, the correction in the revenue stream. But my question was, is how do we get the uh, three reduced tax program um, abbreviations slash definitions on the application form? Oh. Do we have any uh, ability to ask them for 
a change at the legislative level, or how does that happen so that we, in fact, have that clarified? I think it's, uh, we're talking about the form that, that appears on our website when people come down to planning or they fill it out online. And I think it's, I think it's a pretty simple way to just uh, change the wording on that, have the planning department do that. So we can do that ourselves? Yes, I believe we can do that ourselves, and we'll, of course, follow up on that to make sure it happens. But in our discussions with planning, they, were, they, they agreed with the, the proposed wording. So. Okay, we'll proceed to the next report. That's a little more, uh, uh, a few more pages there at the council payable audit. And uh, again, we want to express our appreciation to the, uh, the, the auditees that we're working with, mainly with the finance department, uh, with uh, Gene Roanhorse and his staff. We had some, uh, some very good discussions, and uh, they were very uh, much interested in improving their processes. We'd like to point out that on the very last page of the audit there on page uh, 7 that uh, we could see there had been considerable effort before we arrived to, uh, to document some of their processes with, uh, with accounts payable and uh, making some improvements, uh, particularly in regard to segregation of duties. So we want to point that out. And uh, generally, the, uh, there were adequate, adequate controls over the account payable process. However, we did have four audit findings. And uh, we did get a written response to those that, that should have been, uh, you should have a memo from Gene Roanhorse there. And, uh, and they were pretty much in concurrence with uh, our recommendations. Now, uh, th three of those audit findings relate to what we call the vendor, the master vendor file. The master vendor file is, is kind of that database where we put all the vendors from the city. Um, they they kind of accumulate over the years. I think we're up to about 11,000 uh, vendors in that, in that file. And I think uh, the staff told me that last year they only used about 3,000 of those uh, vendors. Uh, so uh, what, what happens over time, if you don't purge that vendor master file, it just tends to accumulate and you get a lot of vendors in there that haven't been used in, in many years. And one of our recommendations was to go in there and start cleaning up that master vendor file. However, there's a, there's a, there's a software problem involved with that. There's no easy way to, to tell the the, the, the database to get rid of all the vendors that haven't had activity over you know the last three years or four years or five years, um, so we uh, we are working with the IT department. To, uh, we identified a city down in Texas that had figured out a way to do it. There's a there was a system analyst down there that had figured out some way to modify the the program. So we we uh, got him in touch with uh, the finance department up here and the IT department to see if we can figure something out. But um, several of the uh, the issues relate basically to the software packaging that we use. We've used it for over 16 years now, and, and there's, uh, there's just a lot of deficiencies with it. Uh, one of those deficiencies is there's no way to get a good audit trail of the changes that are made to that vendor, the master vendor file, to see, you know, say you want to run a report. What, what has changed in that master vendor file over the last month or two? Say a supervisor wants to look at that. There's no easy way to do that. Um, and that, that's a key control. If you can manipulate that master vendor file, you can, you can do uh, all sorts of bad things. You can create fictitious vendors and that sort of thing. So um, our emphasis was just trying to, to, to clean up that master vendor file and see if we can tighten up some of the controls. And uh, finance has some ideas for doing that. But at some point in the future, they may come to you with uh, uh, asking uh, if we need to switch the, the software package that we've been using for many, many, many years now. Um, there was one other audit issue it related to uh, what we call positive pay, and if you've never heard that term, um, it's something that came about uh, as sort of fraud control. Um, many of you are, have seen the movie with Tom Hanks called uh, Catch Me If You Can. It, it involved, he played an FBI agent. He was on the, the trail of a, uh, a con man played by Leonard DiCaprio, and it was a, a true story. And if you remember that movie, the, uh, the, the con man was, was manipulating checks. He was, uh, you know, he's taking white out and he was doing all sorts of things to the check, the, the, the paper checks, to uh, change the payee and change the amounts and that sort of thing, and then cashing the checks for his own benefit. As a result of, of that case, uh, the, that, uh, that con man uh, became uh, reformed and started working with the FBI and they, they made many, many, um, working with banks and, and the people that make those, that paper check stock, they have a lot of these anti-fraud measures now in that paper. It's very hard to uh, make alterations to checks without it being obvious or trying to photocopy it, it won't, uh, uh, it won't, it's very difficult to do that and pass that off as a real check. 
But the, what the complication was in, in 2004, the President uh, Bush signed into law what's called Check 21. It, it's, a, it's a federal law that changed the way we do banking. If you notice, you don't get your checks back in your check statement normally. Um, you, just get, you get a statement, but you don't get the actual checks back anymore. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, an image of a check is, as good, is, is accepted as, as, as valid. And the problem is that some of those physical security measures on the check stock don't transfer when you, when you make that uh, transition to an electronic image. So the, uh, the recommended uh, control from the GFOA, the Government Finance Office Association, is for cities to look into getting a positive pay uh, feature with their, with their bank provider. Uh, and so let's say we, we do a check run uh, on Thursday, and then we would send a list of our checks to the bank, electronic file, saying this is the checks that we wrote this week, this is the amount, this is the payee. They get that electronic list, and then when the checks start coming to the bank, they can bounce those checks against our list. And if there's a, a difference in the bank account number or the amount or the payee, then they, they call and say, you know, this doesn't match your list. Is this a, is this a valid check? And uh, many, many, many cities around the country are using that feature now, and they've uh, been able to catch some fraudulent checks that way. And uh, as it happens, our, our banking agreement is uh, coming to an end next year, I think in June of next year. So our recommendation was at that time that finance consider whether we should try and seek a positive pay feature from our, our next bank provider, if that makes sense for us. We thought that was a um, potential weakness if we didn't have that. And, and the legislation in Check 21, uh, if, if you choose not to use positive pay and, and a fraudulent check goes through your account, the bank is off the hook and you are responsible for that check because you chose not to use the positive pay. So that's why we uh, made that an audit recommendation. Uh, we had a couple of other um, issues that, that we didn't consider an audit finding. Um, you can see those on page, uh, uh, looks like on page five and six are opportunities for improvement. They had to deal with uh, changing the timeline when the departments have to get their paperwork up to finance to be processed. Uh, kind of moving moving that deadline back a little bit to give the finance staff a little more time to process the uh, the uh, the paperwork coming through, and then we had a recommendation about uh, when they are entering the invoice numbers, the the people in finance uh, we want to have that standardized and and documented so that the uh, whoever is doing that is doing it the same way all the time, entering those invoice numbers exactly the same way, and also when they enter the vendors into the vendor file. Uh, that they do it exactly the same way and they have a, a standardized um, way of doing that and that we had some examples in the report so you can understand what we're talking about there. Um, so uh, as far as the audit went, we had very good cooperation from finance. Uh, you can see the response um, and uh, we had a very good discussion about that. We believe this will uh, improve the controls over accounts payable, which were already pretty good to begin with, but these will just make them a little better. So if you have any questions, I'll take them at this time. Councilor Jameson. Hi, Rich. As far as opportunities for improvement, do you see the accounting system as a, as a problem for you when you do your audits or is there a system? Yeah, that, that, the one problem we thought was, was, was um, a serious was no lot. You can't apparently create an audit trail to see if there's been changes made to the master vendor file. And that would be something that actually the, the finance management would probably use more than the auditors. That would be something if, if they could run a report every month or every quarter just to see what had been changed, that would be a good idea for them. But it's something that when auditors come in every once in a while, that if we could run that report also. But um, apparently we, with HT, you can't apparently generate an audit trail of changes. And that's, that's a problem. So I, I know the uh, system sounds like it's old. Yes, yes, it's quite old. Yes, I think we got it in uh, the fall of 1992, if I, my memory serves me correctly. So. But there's, there's been other issues with HT. It isn't just, just these issues. There's, there's been other uh, difficulties working with HT. So. Is there any public discussion out there about replacing this other than just the thought of it? I, I mean, think finance is considering that. Um, I don't think there's been any, um, they haven't done any RFPs or anything like that at that point. But I think Gene and his staff would be, would be willing to talk to you about that. But uh, If I might, I think the yeah, uh, finance yeah. department is working on a, I don't know specific criteria, or, but putting their ideas together on what they would want, and, and maybe a list of uh, uh, consultants across across the country that are able to help us out with that. But it was, it, it's going to be a monumental shift for the city 
when, if and when that time comes, and it'll be at a considerable cost. So, yeah. uh, but there also should be a significant amount of efficiencies picked up by it as well. Yeah, then you sh I would think there'd be a payback over yeah, time absolutely. on that. But uh, it's it's always a big deal when you change your software. It was I, I've been through. I've been with the city for 25 years. We've had three software changes, and it's never fun because it's a new software to learn, and there's a transition. But um, every so often, you have to do that. If um, um, I think we did it in uh, 1988, and then and I think in, uh, we had one software. We only had it for about two years, and we found that it wasn't satisfactory. And that's at that point we went to HT, and we've had that for 16 years plus. So, any other comments regarding any of the reports? Rich, I was I was curious about the vendor list that uh, obviously gets outdated. How would you uh, enact something like that? Would you give it like a two-year max of inactivity? And well, you, uh, some of the stuff is paid every other year, so two years would be it'd have to be at least two years because some of us, you know, every every other year you pay something, so you don't want to get rid of that vendor. Um, probably a good number is every three or four years if you could figure out a way to inactivate it. You, you don't really delete them; you just inactivate them. Okay. Um, if you've had no activity in three or four years. But uh, I think the finance staff said they looked at it, and, and, and with, out of 11,000 vendors, they'd only used 3,000 last year. So that tells you how we've got a lot of vendors in there that have maybe used it one time in, in uh, you know, 1999, and it's still there as active vendors. So. Okay. Do we re yeah. routinely request things of vendors like insurance certificates, uh, you know, things of that nature? that would go out in mass mailings that we could Well, we there. they do send 1099s out every year. That's a requirement of the IRS. If we've had act, if we paid somebody I think over $500, we send a 1099 out, uh, but nothing routine for for vendors. Uh, you know, if, if if they had a, obviously have a city contract, it's current, they have an insurance requirements, but no, not for the average vendor. Okay. Thank no, you, Rich. No. So Any other questions for Rich? Okay, the only other item on the agenda is Thank an you. executive session, which, uh, oh, I see, just as a point of reference, um, all of Rich's reports go through the audit committee and are, are uh, massaged at that time, and, and, um, and this, these last couple were very few revisions, and Rich and his staff did a very nice job, so, uh, but just so you know that the audit committee does approve of these reports before they come to the city council. Um, and, it, and those reports are all on the website, aren't they, or will be yes. soon? I, I will put those on the, I'll... Talk to the webmaster this week, and they'll be out on SiouxFalls.org. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. okay, so the last item is the executive session, which I don't believe we have any topics for. Councilor Knudsen? Yeah, um, are we, we going to just speak for just, just among ourselves just a little bit to get started on the legislative priorities? Would you care to do that at this time? Well, I, I think it might not be bad just to just start the discussion just because I know our breakfast club meeting, you know, on November... 19th is we are supposed to take our our legislative priorities then and um, I, I mean I don't know I wouldn't mind just a short discussion on legislative priority priorities just to kind of get a feel where the group is or the majority of the group I mean why don't you go ahead and start us off okay is that thank you Councillor Costello is that I was studying um, actually I have a, a nice old file from 2002 it's kind of fun to go through our legislative priorities during that time. And again, I don't really think that these, you know, resolutions are like, you know, I don't think the legislators stay up all night reading them or anything, but I think it's still appropriate for us to, to just um, take a stance, um, you know, just try to tell them, the legislators, um, what our priorities are. And when I look at the ones from last year, uh, um, the, I guess a couple, of, uh, these are just some personal thoughts is, the one as far as the number one was strong support of home rule, la, la, la. Of course, I'm a very, very strong proponent of home rule, but, but I actually think that that one, even though we've been carrying that on the books for a while, is so obvious that it's meaningless, uh, really, because there's no, there's no movement underfoot at the legislature to weaken home rule. Uh, so so I, um, it would be my vote to, to uh, say something that matters more and to uh, eliminate number one. On uh, number two, I think that we should leave that one in there for sure. The Sioux Falls City Council strongly encourages the legislature to permit municipalities to have local control over taxation and fees. I think that, that to me, I think says lots. Um, um, number three from last year, I'm still very comfortable. Uh, well, actually, I, I, I'm sorry. That one I think we're probably pretty much uh, taken care of during the last legislative session on the, on the liquor licenses bit, so I could eliminate that one. 
And then four from last year says the <clears throat> Sioux Falls City Council strongly encourages the legislature to permit municipalities to have local control to regulate the sale and use of tobacco products. And, and of course, I, I, I'm a very, very, that's a, uh, I love to see that. I really like to see that one stay on the list too. So from last year, I'd like to see, I'd like to suggest that we keep number two and number four. And then I would like to add a few, just a couple actually, uh, only a couple. Uh, one, I'd like to see some kind of wording like this, and you, know, you can improve the wording as you wish. I'd like to encourage the South Dakota Legislature in 2009 to take whatever steps are necessary to ensure adequate funding uh, is available for priority new road projects. You know, you think about the 85th Street interchange, which impacts our city tremendously. You think about the Marion Road interchange, which also is an, very important for our city. And then the third one that comes to my mind right away is just the whole South Dakota 100 project, which you know ultimately is going to be a, a beltway around Sioux Falls um, if we can get it uh, funded appropriately and get it built. And then um, another, um, uh, you know, so so that'd be like number three. You know, we've got one, two, three, and now number four. Suggestion by me for starters and discussion would be um, the triple B uh, uh, issue, which again is. Uh, a permissive legislation. I'd really like to see the South Dakota legislature have the courage to allow municipalities throughout the state to enact permissive legislation regarding Triple B, which is bed, you know, is uh, casually referred to as bed, booze, and board, which of course means meals. Uh, but that permissive legislation is important for many of our cities. And uh, and then um, and then my last one, my last suggestion for today fits in a little bit with number four from last year, and I would, uh, uh, it fits in really quite closely, so maybe it could just be added as a sentence to number four, would be something like, um, I would like to encourage the South Dakota legislature in 2009 uh, to repeal the preemption uh, law on the books that's been there, I believe, since 1995, uh, which uh, uh, again regards uh, smoking and it ties up the smoking issues very uh, much in the, um, at the state level when in fact I believe that uh, we in our community should have um, control of smoking matters. So that's where I am for a starter. I, I got confused on some of that, D. Um, okay, so the first one, uh, which is home rule oriented, you, you don't see the need for that. I, I really don't. Okay. I, I, we were discussing that at home some over the weekend, but I, I really don't. I mean, again, I just think it's so obvious. It's okay. kind of like motherhood and apple pie and flags and, and everything. And I mean, item, it's just. I, it's, item two is a liquor license, which we think we've crossed that bridge. We don't need to. Um, let's see. Uh, number, two, number two, um, uh, or I'm sorry, you know what, Pat? I'm sorry, Councilor Castell, you know why I'm confusing you is I'm sorry, I was looking. Um, thank you, Kermit. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I was looking at the 2007 legislative session, not 2008, so I'm sorry I confused you on that. And so I'll, I'll borrow Kermit, or I'll, I'll borrow Councillor Stager's list here on, um, from last year, I apologize for that um, oversight. Is that, um, again, I recommend um, eliminating number one from last year. I um, recommend eliminating number, uh, Two, because I believe that was done successfully last year, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, uh, number three, I'd like to leave on the books and and uh, and possibly just add a sentence on there for number uh, three that would encourage the South Dakota 2000, the um, 2009 South Dakota Legislature to repeal a preemption, um, you know, um, which would again uh, allow local control of smoking matters. But really, but really, that says that in number three anyway. I mean, I just wouldn't mind if we'd add that, uh, the, you know, I wouldn't mind if we'd add the words about the per, um, preemption bit. And then let's see, and um, four is, I remember uh, uh, on um, four from last year, again, it regards the increasing the 9-11 funding surcharge, which I, I believe I was the one who suggested that last year because I, I really, um, believed in providing more money for Metro Communications, but I believe, I know it's only like 75 cents a month right now, which still seems kind of minor, but I think one of the other counselors um, told me that I might be, I, that that might not be as needed as I thought. So I guess I'm not sure where we are on that one. We maybe I, should 
check into that and, one. And just speaking on behalf of Metro Management, Councilor Benning and I are both on that. I think mm -hmm. if uh, we had some help from the state regarding uh, the enforcing and collecting the fee, and I think there's some concern that particularly on cell phones and uh, others and in today's age, a lot okay. of people are switching to cell phones and making sure that we have the ability to collect it on, on cell phone lines. Okay, and so let's, so then I um, thank you for that clarification. So again, I would, so I would, um, I would take number four off from last year and then, um, and I would leave number five, five on from last year, which is again to permit municipalities to have local control over taxation and fees just in general. And then I would just add those others that I mentioned. And again, I apologize for my confusion. Well, just for uh, my own uh, point of reference, my personal opinion, and, and uh, um, I concur with uh, eliminating the one and two um, regarding the use of, uh, regulate the sale of tobacco products. Um, you know, I, I for one am all for local control, uh, but I believe some things do need to stay with the state. And the issue on the tobacco products is that I believe that if we, the city had uh, control of that, um, we would become a non-smoking city the moment we could. And the problem that that creates is that uh, it, cre it creates uh, unfair advantages amongst retailers, uh, particularly those um, on the outskirts of Sioux Falls, uh, Brandon, Harrisburg, uh, T, uh, in those areas where it, it creates competitive advantages and disadvantages to the city uh, establishments. And the other issue is that it clearly, without doubt, and I would just ask you to in, uh, inquire to Sheriff Milstead or, or our police chief, but it will put more intoxicated drivers on the road for longer distances in the evening. There's no question about that. So I mean, that's, that's if, if we knew that all the municipalities around us in a close proximity would follow suit and go non-smoking, it probably wouldn't be such a big deal. But it, that hodgepodge of laws, and I think all you have to do is look to uh, North Dakota with Fargo and Moorhead or go to Minneapolis and look at their different suburbs and the pain those communities went through when some of them were non-smoking and some of them were. I would, in our establishments, we would absolutely would agree to go non-smoking in all of them as long as it's a level playing field. Councilor Costello, on just on that issue, is it, um, I really, of course, respect your opinion on that topic and I, um, I just so much look forward to the day in South Dakota that all of our cities uh, have the uh, same, uh, you know, have, have, are able to enact a, uh, a non-smoking, uh, um, or, or I should say a smoking ban. And just even in the New York Times yesterday, there's a large article about, you know, Boston. I mean, even on college campuses, I mean, they're saying no smoking. I mean, uh, San Francisco, I mean, we're, we're frankly um, still behind on that issue, but I, I respect your views on that. But Any other comments? I'm just going to ask on number two, um, you know, Yvonne was going to be here and I wanted her to comment on uh, her looking forward at the um, liquor license issue. As you recall, your, the council was going to vote on um, allowing the city to sell more licenses, but we were kind of waiting on a rule from Department of Revenue and that has come through and, and I think there may be some more efforts on that to maybe even close that down. So I, I guess I'd like some of her input before we um, take that off I the table. I'm not aware of that. What was the ruling out of the Department of Revenue? Um, most of those questions were technical in nature, and they weren't actually about the licenses being issued, but more about once you've issued it. Um, and I haven't, I don't have that report, but they did actually answer those questions. Um, it didn't affect. Did that? or did not? Did, did answer those questions. And it really doesn't affect the legality of the um, statute being put in place to allow cities to do the, to issue those restaurant licenses. Um, but I also know there's been some rumblings that I've kind of heard of the Municipal League so I just wanted to double check before we delete it. Going uh, along with um, uh, Deborah's comments, I'm curious, I mean, so, um, and again, I have not been what you call uh, very active, like none at all in Municipal League, but, but except for um, supportive of, of its hard work. But anyway, but so at this point, does the Municipal League have some strong legislative priorities that would dovetail into what we are trying to do, Councilor Brown? It does each year adopt. It has policy statements, um, and I can provide those to the council. I can get copies of those if you'd all like to see those. Any other items for discussion or any discussion at all? And we have no executive sessions, so nothing else. We will adjourn for the day. Thank you.